tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 19. I'm your host, Jason Hill. And strap on in, kiddies, this intro's gonna be a long one. Ah, and, uh, before one of you offers another adoring comment on that subject, just remember, you can skip it with a flick of your finger. Like so. Ooh. Come on. Feels good. Do it. Stick your finger on the screen and gently slide it to the right. Mm. I don't know who that was, but that one was good. Yeah, mm. just like that. Okay. Ooh. You've done this before, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Alrighty. Tonight's story is Garden of Fiends, written by Horror Hill newcomer Mark Matthews, and it addresses, quite viscerally, the subject of addiction. Now, addiction is a subject that is of personal interest to me, and themes such as those presented within this tale strike that particular chord with gusto. Additionally, the two stories I hear the most about from listeners are still Knuckles Supper and The Pill Mills so I'm clearly not the only one. That being said, when those stories aired, I received multiple messages that some listeners found those tales triggering and were concerned that people in recovery would be adversely influenced by them. Now, I generally try to be sparing with the trigger warnings because my feelings on them in the culture are mixed, to say the very least. But this story digs very, very deep into the culture and experience of living with addiction. So, if you are a former addict, or you are close to someone who is, be warned, this one may hit close to home. Also, this story is a novella, and it is rather long, so it will be broken up. Just consider it the third entry in the Horror Hill Addiction series, which is unofficial, but I'm making it a thing now. It also appears in another collection from 2017, also entitled Garden of Fiends. It's quite good. I recommend. Hopefully, we will get at least one more story from it one day. But until then... Shall we? Ooh, one more thing. Happy belated birthday to longtime listener Missy Ann. You've stuck with the show for quite some time, and your support means quite a bit to me. Thank you. Also, and this one will be quick, just don't forget to become a patron. Go to simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get a lot of stuff, you'll help us out. No ads. It's quite a studly move. I know you can do it. For me. Now, 
Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, without further ado, from author Mark Matthews, I give you part one of Garden of Fiends. Chapter One Tara Snyder Stop listening right now if you don't want to hear the truth. I know you all think I overdosed and died, or that I was off somewhere getting high. I wanted to. Death didn't scare me. Staying clean did. I never thought my life would be this dark and this cold, always hungry for something. Somehow I kept alive. I kept waking up. So, I went back to detox. Again. And here I am, back at N.A. Again. My voice quivered and tears welled behind my eyelids. Any more words and truths too deep might spill out, so I stopped talking and gazed at my wrist. I traced my dirty fingernails along the cursive letters of my tattoo. The girl with kaleidoscope eyes. The woman next to me laid a hand on my arm and then pulled it back. I wish she had kept it there. Her touch was swarming. The Narcotics Anonymous table meeting moved on, and I couldn't stop my knee from bobbing up and down as I listened to the next person speak. He wore a pinstripe suit, white shirt with a top button undone, red tie loosened, and his own neck tattoo was revealed just beneath the collar line. In the middle of the table, within arm's reach, sat a woven basket full of donations. At least twenty bucks was inside, enough for a pack of dope, if anyone chose to jump ship. But I didn't need dope money. Not anymore. How clean my skin had become. How rested my veins were. I hadn't cooked up a pack of dope for four months straight. The first time I went to an N.A. meeting was three years ago. I put on a fake smile and told them how happy I was to be there. But the whole time, I was itching to leave. I was certain I was missing an essential gene. The very gene that made people know how to live without drugs. I was defective. And unfixable. As soon as the meeting ended, I rushed to the parking lot where Brett waited. I chopped and snorted an Oxycontin off his Metallica CD cover. God, I needed that. We continued our life of ripping off places like Home Depot, stealing tool sets, drills, even generators, and then returning them for cash. We made $300 a day sometimes, and needed it all for pills. Then, the morning came, we learned Home Depot changed its return policy, and we were stuck with dark pain in our bodies, aching for a fix, but unable to scrape up the cash. No problem. Heroin was cheap and easy to find. Brett tied some plastic around my arm. Warm, blue veins rose to meet the cold metal syringe, and he injected me with dope. I was cured. Defective, no more. After years of scamming and shooting moves, it caught up with us. Rat went to jail, and I went to treatment. And even at NA meetings with 200 people sitting around these 20 tables, I felt alone. I ran 
ran my fingers through my black, spiky hair, smooth and shiny from conditioner, while Mr. Pinstripe's suit talked about acceptance. Next to me sat Stacy, who I wished would be talking instead. She weaved a magic spell each time she shared. Nine years clean, and her energy radiated into all of those who would listen. Tapping into her spirit was my best hope to stay clean, so I had rehearsed asking her, Stacy, will you be my sponsor? Stacy? I'm looking for a sponsor, and... Stacy, do you have space to sponsor someone else? Mr. Pinstripe shared his last words. The table meeting ended and the members huddled for a closing prayer. Stacy stood, and we made eye contact for a split second. I tried to speak, but my throat felt dry, and my soul turned to stone. She was surrounded by so many others who craved her attention. I had to wait my turn. I spent the time nibbling on my nails. Working in the garden with my parents had left dark bits of soil underneath each nail and it crunched on my teeth. But I didn't mind. The dirt melted in my saliva and felt like tiny granola pieces. Stacy kept talking, so I kept chewing until I got a good grip with a canine tooth and ripped the nail across the top. Nobody was looking, so I spit it to the ground. I leaned against the wall, cell phone in hand, waiting for the text from my dad, saying, Where are you? Stacy was surrounded by happy, sober dope fiends, chatting away with smiling eyes as if at a cocktail party. None of them had the defective gene. On to the next fingernail. Crunchy dirt on my tongue, canines clamped down, ripped across the top, and puked. Someone from another table saw me spit that one. I could feel the energy of their eyes on my cheek. I heard footsteps approach, like an unseen Home Depot security guard. My eyes perked up. And there he was. Brett. Clean shine from his shaven head walking with swagger. My heart valves fired open. Sweat bubbled on my skin. Where's the exit? I looked at the door and measured the number of steps until I'd be gone, but the next thing I knew, my vision was full of Brett. My back hunched like a Halloween black cat while he stood tall like a cobra. Guilt raced through my blood like I'd abandoned a sick loved one. Expecting me? He asked. I shuffled my feet on the floor, scraping the bottoms of my black boots. Hell no. You had three more months, I thought. Talked the judge into work release, and now I'm employed. I am an employee. I canvass neighborhoods for new window sales. Doing good. As long as I get back on time, I got until eight tonight. In fact, going to this N.A. meeting buys me more time. Brett waved his signature sheet with contact names to confirm attendance. I drove by your house a couple times. Could have gone to prison for breaking your dad's restraining order, but it was worth trying to see you. Thought about stopping, but I kept on. I knew I'd see you soon enough. And you knew it too. I imagined his rusty jeep slowly rolling down my street. My dad out front mowing the lawn, seeing Brett. Wondering if he should call the cops or attack Brett with his fists. God damn amazing. Work release. You never get your ass in a pinch your mouth can't get you out of. That sounded more spiteful than I wanted it to, and I stared at his pupils looking for a sign he was high. No pinhole eyes, no yawning, no itching, no runny nose, no nods of the head. Nothing. He was clean, like his former self reborn. Same as me. Fuck, Brett, you're out. You know what I've been through? 
You're talking nonsense. What you have been through? I was in jail, Tara. I am in jail. Almost got prison time. Lucky to be here. <laughs> what you have been through? I felt my chest getting pulled. Him, a magnet. Me, a defective piece of metal. He was right. I knew I'd see him soon enough. I was expecting him. But not there. Not then. I'm sorry, I I gotta go. My dad's waiting. If he knew I was with you, he'd call the police. He thinks you're in jail, and they're supposed to tell him when you get out. Victims' rights and shit, you know? Tara, it's me. I will not trip you up. I will bow to your performance, but not participate. You go if you need to. He touched my arm. I flinched, like his flesh was flame and blistered my skin, but then... Let it be. I remembered each circle of his fingerprints, and today could feel that he was clean. No dope inside his body. How often we had embraced with cramping, sweaty skin waiting to get high. But not today. He looked good, as when we first met. Our first date was a Slipknot concert, and Brett was in the center of a mosh pit where rib cages got smashed, eyes got blackened, bodies collided like atoms creating nuclear explosions. Brett was just a tiny cell in the big mass, and I wanted to possess that same power. Text from Dad. I scanned my phone. Hi, sweet pea. Burritos for dinner. I'll get Tabasco sauce if you want some. My ticket to leave. Instead, I texted back. Meeting still going strong. I didn't want to leave. Brett was a warm, dirty blanket. Picked up off the floor on a winter morning and wrapped around some aching bones. It felt right to walk with him out the door. I was someone special. Someone longed for. I didn't have to fight for his time and attention. It wasn't long before I was back in his Jeep Wrangler. Hard top off, Burger King wrappers on the floor, monster energy drink in the cup holder. We'd gone on countless adventures in that Jeep. Once, we had to get it out of impound... Other times we'd stand by with an empty gas can, getting suckers to believe we were out of gas and needed five bucks to fill up. Once we had fifty bucks, we filled up our veins. Back in the passenger seat, the memories and the wind whooshed through me. Had he found another girl to sit in that seat yet? No sign of marijuana roaches in the ashtray. No works anywhere. You finished rehab. I know this. Right after we got busted. And that's what made your judge happy? He said. Or asked. I wasn't sure which through the rushing wind. Yep. Under advisement. Did treatment, and if I stay clean for a year, they'll drop the charges. Brett turned his head as if to spit out the disgust in his mouth. You're the stupid fuck who got us caught, I said. We stole way too much. If we had just wrote one check, my dad wouldn't have noticed. Yeah, we were both stupid and got caught up. I sit in jail and think about you all the time. It wasn't me that got us caught. It's just me was doing time for us both. Time. Maybe I'd have been better off doing jail time than sitting in rehab listening while my therapist kept poking at my sore spots. And the family therapy sessions, my crunchy granola mom and my brooding, controlling dad. Just the look in their eyes made me want to get high. You were taking this clean stuff serious. I can tell, Brad said. I watched you all meeting long. It's good. Good for you. Clean your soul. We always knew you were the strong one. Always knew you might leave me by myself. But I'm tired of getting caught up, too. 
Doesn't mean I'm not going to make some coin, though. We're going to stay clinging together, and together we need to take a trip to Russell's about now. My left ventricle valve fired open and my heart filled with charcoal dust. Russell's. The place we scored often. The place I still had drug dreams about, often waking up soon as the syringe poked my vein and then wondering if I really got high or just dreamt it. Brett was taking us there, and I could feel the heat of his thoughts, his determination, cylinders firing in his head, foot firmly on the pedal. I was a hostage of sorts, an eternal lover of another. Fuck that, I don't want to go there. Take me home. No response. The pavement underneath slipped by faster. We were shooting down Fenkel toward the city, zipping past party stores, gas stations, and bus stop signs where downtrodden figures huddled around and held their heads low. Tara, 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 that is nonsense. You really think I'd let you get high? I'm not getting high, and neither are you. And you don't even have to come inside if you don't want, but don't you want them to see how good you look? Last memory they have of you is nasty. I feel proud of what my girlfriend looks like clean. My silence gave approval, and my eyes drifted to my cell. No follow-up text from Dad yet. We pulled down the street, same party store on the corner, same men leaning against the brick wall, drinking from paper bags. Suspicious creatures shuffled down the street. Russell's house was covered in permanent shade from a huge towering tree that dropped tiny little helicopter seed pods that would twirl to the ground. In the driveway, huge weeds grew from the cracks. A strained mattress leaned against the side of the brick house. That was new. How good it felt going there sober instead of dope sick. So many days I'd walk under the shade of the tree, seed pods raining down while I prayed to the heavens someone, anyone, would help us out. We would knock on the door. 5.30 a.m. as the morning birds chirped and us begging for a pack. More than once, we'd have to drive away and come back later when Russell was awake. But there I was, in control, not a strung-out ghoul of the night, but above them all. I did want to see Russell and let him know I wasn't the mascara-stained crazy bitch they'd called me last time. Nothing but smooth, clean skin on me. A touch of makeup and dark eyeliner made my pupils zing. Life pumped solid underneath my cheeks, natural rouge. And I wore a fresh pair of Levi 520 jeans and black leather boots with heavy buckles. Glad you're with me, he said, and grabbed my shoulder. You left me. I never thought you'd leave me, always thought we'd be together. I knew it. I know you. We walked up the front steps and heard the music pumping inside. The front door vibrated from the base. It took some knocks and patience, but soon enough, Russell answered. A gun tucked into his waist, muscles ripped under his shirt from who knows where. Just born that way, I guess. He'd never gotten high off dope or took a puff of crack. Just the occasional Gilby's gin with squirt. Well, damn, look who's here, he announced to uncaring faces sitting on the couch. Come on into the house of worship. Y'all know you ain't getting shit, and I ain't saying a word until you lift your shirt. Freaks who've been gone long as you two looking to bust someone higher up the food chain. You show me you ain't recording what I'm preaching up in this bitch. I knew exactly what he meant. People get arrested for possession, claim they can help bust a dealer and a lighter sentence hangs in the balance. Brad had to hold his shirt up and show front and back to prove he wasn't wearing a wire. And now the bay, Russell said. That meant me. 
I thought of leaving, but that would make me look guilty, and I've seen more than one bay get her ass beat here. So, I lifted up my shirt, bra exposed, all eyes on me. Russell gave the okay, and my blood pressure dropped. She is looking wonderful, beautiful, right? Brett said. She's done getting high, going straight forever. Going to N.A., taking 12 steps, so don't even ask. She does not want it. Brett and Russell walked off to the back bedroom, promising to be just a minute, and I scanned the room for a friendly face. Russell's friends were high on the couch, but it was the basement where the real freaks were. I could feel death seeping up the basement stairs. Crackheads who'd been down there for days. Dope fiends nodding out. Overdosed bodies that get dragged to the side and dumped off somewhere. Near a hospital, if they're lucky. All of that was just below my feet. I was safe upstairs, but had no place to sit. The sunken couch was full of newer customers. None that I recognized. I was alone. My moment to shine had faded. I put my back against the wall and slid down to the floor. The area rug was dotted with pinhole burns, the hardwood floor with a coating of dust. I saw a little spider crawling along with tiny, frantic legs. Just a baby, probably. A man walked over, each of his skeletal limbs jerky and agitated and his jaw sliding back and forth. Bony arms shot out of his green t-shirt that had 88 written on it in white. I got ready to dash or punch him in the neck or nuts, but he kept his distance and sat down nearby with a stem and a lighter, ready to take a hit. I've seen you, he said, proud of himself. You want a hit? I'll give you a hit, nothing for free, of course. You don't have to touch a thing, just show me a bit. Just lift your shirt like you did, just show me a little more. I pulled my legs into my chest, wrapped my arms around my legs, and blasted him with my eyes. Crackheads are the least dangerous men on earth when they're smoking, and he'd be sucking the glass dick in a second. His own limp and not dangerous. Just waiting on Brett. I said. So fuck off. Oh, I know. He laughed. I seen you with him. I know you two are buying smack. You shouldn't be shooting that shit, you know? You ain't seen any of us sticking a needle in our arms and dying like that. Hells no. You know, someday someone like Brett is gonna chop you up. You know that, right? That's what they do, Bretts. They poke holes in you until all that's left are little itty-bitty pieces. I got up to leave, gave him a look that stopped him from moving, just as the door down the hall opened and a crack of light spilled from the bedroom. Brent and Russell appeared. Brent motioned me over with his head. I refused with a shake of mine. Come on, he beckoned again. Come here. Almost done. I made a defiant march down the hallway, and Brett held the door while I walked inside. Not much had changed in the bedroom other than a bigger pile of clothes on the floor. The same yellow mattress rested on the ground near a card table littered with empty liquor bottles and overflowing ashtrays. The walls were stained from rotting souls of those who'd been there before us. Brett shut the door. So what the fuck is this about? You didn't get high, did you? No, Tara, why don't you trust me? I just bought some to bring back with me to lock up. I can get a hundred bucks for two packs of dope. I got a plan. Just gonna eat this in a tiny piece of plastic, and after my morning crap, I got major coin. The walls started to move in, come together to squish me. My fingers shook as I checked my phone. Expect to hear from you, sweet pea. My dad had texted me ten minutes ago. Getting coffee with Stacy. I quickly thumbed back. Your dad, right? 
It's always your dad. I know he loves you, but he don't know you like I do. He loves you for who you were. I love you for what you are. He made you, but he doesn't know you. He made you, but he doesn't know you. Last time I heard that was in a Motel 6. My dad looking for me with ads in the paper while I fixed up. Brent urging me not to respond. He made you, but he doesn't know you. Brett raised the packs of dope before my eyes. Tiny cells inside me started to wake. Voices of my craving started to whisper. Tara, you realize how strong you are? How powerful you are? You proved you can stop. And today might be the last time you'll see me in a long time, so listen to my logic. You need to use one, just one. Oh, it's perfect. You'll have to stop since I'm spending the night back in jail and this will get you through. Then tomorrow, you do some N.A. to get back on track and I'll know you were happy when I'm back in county lockup. Just one. For me. Brett's eyes pleaded. Mine looked to the floor. Another spider. Same style as the one before when crawling for cover. Oh God, I need you to fix. The dam I'd built to hold back my cravings was starting to break. The leaks were springing. I needed a release from the pain of living. I needed to feel happy and loved and Brett was right. I'd use just this once and then get back on track. Oh, it would feel so... Just one more time to remember how beautiful life can be, to remove the defects that I have been cursed with since birth. No more anger, no more hurt, rage, shame, all of it, all of it will float away and I'd feel fine. I'd feel fine. Dope was love and Brett, Brett, Brett had brought it, brought it to me. Just one. Brett didn't take long to get works from the nightstand and fix up with precision. Boiling the spoon, then filling the syringe. The poke into my flesh was heaven. The sharp bite of the needle. The warm, gentle orgasm spreading up my back and through my blood. God. That was how I wanted to feel always. I had forgotten what it was like not to hate to exist. The burden of having a body, oh, such comfort, such peace. Oh, God. Oh, but something was wrong. Oh, it was all too much. I looked up to Brett and his eyelids fluttered. His head started to nod. His face was a smug smile, but not mine. The air was too thick to breathe. My heart was too tired to be. My eyelids too heavy for my face. Love was lost, heaven on fire. Angels flew away. Vultures took their place. Ventricles closed. Lungs slowed. Mouth foamed. Kaleidoscope eyes closed. Hello friends, let's face it, moving sucks. It sucks. And no, I'm not talking about moving houses, I'm talking about moving your body. It's awful, repulsive, disgusting. 
a convoluted cascade of chemical and electrical signals that bubble out of your murky, mushy brain fluid, slithers down your spine, and forces you to defy sacred laziness and do horrible, horrible things. Like going to work, going to school, going to the bathroom. Ugh, the very thought is enough to make a man sick. I have to say, folks, I didn't start to stop moving forward in life until I joined the Sons of Lethargy. Now, I finally feel like I'm really not going places. But what to do for entertainment? Pious contemplation is fun for the first 12 hours, but what then? What then? Well, let me tell you about a little game I found. A game that requires lifting only a few grams of weight and only the most minimalist of thumb strokes. Oh yes, I'm talking about best fiends. And that is fiends, not friends. Fiends. The match three puzzle game you can play anywhere, and I do mean fucking anywhere. The gym, work, Ugh, school, the shores of Gichigumi, the sands of Iwo Jima, or, in my case, from a fortified bathroom fortress where I sit upon a toilet of tranquility, completely, perfectly immobile, with the exception of my thumbs, as I said, and my autonomic nervous system, which I can't really stop unless I really concentrate. But I don't even think about that while I'm befriending bugs and killing slugs and best fiends. Because that's what you do in the game. A gaming experience that is free to download and easily fits into any, any lifestyle. Even among those who move. Hey, 100 million downloads, there's got to be a reason for that, am I right? I am obsessed. So you should at least check it out. Unplug for a bit. Sit down. Make yourself comfy. And play a little Best Fiends. Who knows? Maybe you might just decide to sit there forever. Just like me. So it might be good to start with the toilet. And download Best Fiends free on the App Store or Google Play. Oh yes. That is best fiends. Not friends. Fiends. It's friends. Without the R. Chapter 2 Gregory Snyder The sweat on my skin was black from dirt as soon as it squeezed out of my pores. My insides were boiling right out of my flesh. On the ground, pockets of snow had all disappeared under the blue skies and golden sun. It was April, and time to plant. I stabbed the spade into the earth, stood on top to use my full weight and then twisted deep into the wound. Nearby, my wife's shoulders gleamed in the sun, her muscles sinewy, her limbs strong as tree trunks. Garden tools were just part of her fingertips. She was used to this work. Me, just a weekend warrior. Her, living the dream of building this urban farm in Detroit. A small bit of land, one of a handful given out as grants by the city, was closer to a garden than a farm, but she had plans to make it expand. Someday we'll have a porch, a gathering place with a table, chairs, and a hose to rinse the produce and neighbors can eat fresh off the vine. She spoke with her eyes to the ground, 
studying it for any trace of rubble that needed to be removed or that might contaminate her soil. The soil had been tested with alkaline levels and pH values, but it needed to pass the eye test. I hope the house they tore down had no asbestos inside. Just the tiniest bits will be part of the vegetables the community eats and will be soaked up into the bodies of these people who already suffer so much. So much. I've seen it. She was fishing for comfort, and I took the bait. We saw them tearing the place down. No face masks on, nothing. No asbestos. But what kind of lives did the people lead here? All of it ends up in the soil. All of it. And it feeds the plants we eat and goes right into our souls. She got on her knees, praying position, while my eyes scanned the horizon. The only person in sight was Lorenzo, pushing his grocery cart with squeaky wheels down the sidewalk. I'm Heather, and I'll be working here. My wife introduced herself weeks ago with hand outstretched. I'm Lorenzo. I'll be living here, he had answered. The man had a gray, splotchy beard, dark green jacket, and plenty of skills to live out here in the urban wild. And I was looking for my lost treasure. The city had eaten up our daughter. Tara had been gone for three days. Her disappearance wasn't that unusual, but after her last run at the treatment center, she'd been staying clean. I could feel the sobriety in her veins, same way I could feel the weather. Each day without dope, she was getting younger, turning back time to when she dreamed of playing soccer in the Olympics, doodled cartoons, and wanted to be a veterinarian. I felt a buzz at my hip and checked my cell with dirty hands. Nothing. No calls. No text. Just a phantom buzz. Where is she? Even with her doing so well lately, I'd learned not to let the hope seem real. Best to expect nothing. Hope was dangerous. Expectations lead to resentments, her therapist had said. Your daughter has a disease, you have to understand that, the therapist said to me again and again. I agreed, and that's why I tried to cut the poison out. I pressed charges against her boyfriend who convinced her to steal my checkbook. He got six months in jail, Tara got probation, and I had her hate buzzing at me for life. I love you enough that I'm okay if you hate me as long as I keep you alive, I had explained to her. You put the only thing I love in jail she replied. That's twisted. That's not love. The therapist kept quiet. I looked around the room at posters on the walls about serenity and other heroics. The water fountain on a shelf was plugged in to keep it bubbling over fake plastic rocks. There is a bond that happens when you get high together, her therapist finally chimed in. Brett fed her sickness. Imagine, Mr. Snyder, if every day you woke up dying of thirst and hunger, but only one person brought you food and drink. Dope was love to Tara. Love was dope. And Brett brought it to her. Heroin had hijacked my girl. And here I was, wasting time planting a garden instead of out looking for her. Another buzz in my pocket. I checked my phone, but once again, nothing. Phantom hopes and phantom buzzes. I plopped the spade back into the earth with an angry grunt as if it was the kill shot, and the volunteer helping us flinched. He had long black hair and a black scruffy beard. Che Guevara, I called him. He was spreading compost, but had no idea what type of treasure he had. Heather got up to hell. The organic matter is alive, she explained, spreading it over the earth in graceful dashes. You're feeding the earth. The ground becomes a digestive tract. Think of it this way. 
The garden is just farming us, giving us air to breathe, fattening us up, making us juicy and oozing with nutrients. Then, the plants consume us after our dead bodies decompose at their roots. My wife would make sure that our bounty would be an oasis in the middle of urban decay, a feeding place for those lost in the deserted city. My eyes circled the horizon, but all I saw were buildings that seemed bombed apart. Black burn marks around windows boarded up front doors full of graffiti, crumbling brick, sharp edges of broken windows waiting to rip apart any humans who entered through them. All of them the corpses of hopes once alive. Somewhere in this urban jungle, my daughter Tara had probably gotten a pack of heroin. Tara had been here, working alongside us last week, digging in the earth on a day much cooler, and the ground not so soft. Hadn't we laughed and smiled together? Hadn't she taken a break with Che Guevara? and dug a deep hole in the ground, saying he'd be the first to die in the revolution, so why not have his grave ready? Compost would eat you up, Heather had said. I'd have happily walked Tara down the aisle to marry her off to this revolutionist. A Chevy Malibu drove by, a group of kids inside, the driver peering at the sign out front. Garden of Friends where good things help people grow, was written in small italics and quote marks, as if the phrase itself was being stolen. We had debated about a fence for hours, unsure if it would seem too impersonal, but finally decided we need one to keep out stray dogs, rabbits, and the random city deer. Tara and I had even made a scarecrow and propped it up with a broomstick, it had branches for arms, twigs for fingers, a hat sewn on to its head, and a green shirt stuffed with hay. A permanent, insane smile was drawn across its face with a black sharpie. I needed a scarecrow for my home, something to stop the dope fiends like Brett, who'd taken my daughter through the years. They wouldn't stay in jail long enough and restraining orders were just paper. Phantom buzz. I put the spade down and reached for my cell. Nothing. Heather noticed this time. She's going to come back soon. She always does. Just looking to find herself, that's all. She'll come back when she knows she's ready. That spiritual optimism I fell in love with remained, but my hide had been roughened and bricks had loosened and toppled. The ghouls of the city had taken my daughter, hooked their claws into her flesh, and ripped the precious gem from my heart. Heather looked to the earth for answers, grabbing handfuls of dirt and letting it sift through her fingers, waiting for plants to spring forth. That would take weeks, but I needed action today. I need to go, Heather. I'm going to go early to do a few things. I'll get home soon enough and have dinner ready, okay? Wash the pasta, please, and I'll be just 30 minutes behind. Remember, leave the door open. We're not locking it. Times like these, we always leave the door open in case Tara walks home. The therapist had sent to kick her out. Tough love. Let her suffer. But Heather shut that down with the silent power of Gandhi. Our door is always open. She did not relapse, Heather promised. She's just taking time. Be careful what you put out in the universe. A relapse. God, each time hurt more than the last. Stains upon stains upon stains. Nobody was as good about giving space as Heather was. To me, to Tara, to the seeds in the earth. Still, I didn't want her to know where I was driving to. I loaded up some tools in the trunk, 
then drove until out of eyesight. I was a one-man search party, driving down streets I knew Tara had been down. Brentwood to Linwood, Fenkel to Telegraph. I hovered down the road like a lost UPS worker. Houses on the street looked on with windows like eyes, awnings like eyelids. I peered into all of them. None of them blinked. I knew I was wasting my time. The only real hope was to go straight to the source. I had followed Tara to her drug dealer's house more than once. I knew the way. I pulled up front, the house hidden under a dark tree, trash on the driveway, and customers walking up to the door as if the house was sucking them inside. I parked and waited for the rubble of my engine to fade. When I had come here before, I would stay out front, hoping I could notice Tara's gate, then rush out to bring her home. Not tonight. Tonight, I was going inside. Hello, friends. My name is Jason Hill, founder of the Church of Jason Hill of Sedentary Saints, where we forsake the pleasures of fast and slow twitch muscular action and live only by the guiding light of our autonomic nervous systems, sustaining ourselves only through DoorDash, padded toilet seats, and a little game called Best Fiends. A man even a son of lethargy like myself or a woman, cannot live completely without entertainment, and Best Fiends fits gloriously into my mineral-like lifestyle. I like to pleasure myself with all the colorful and endearing characters you can unlock. I mean, <clears throat> please myself. <laughs> Glad I caught that. My favorite is Newt the Newt because he has a plump body and stumpy little appendages presumably atrophied through his continued avoidance of physical activity, just like me. Newt and I are like the angel of death to the army of slugs occupying the fiend's forest, but that ain't the half of it. There are thousands, literally thousands, of engaging and challenging puzzles to solve with more added every day. It is a match three killing spree that helps me easily whittle away the hours while I wait for the DoorDash guy to find the food funnel that leads to my underground lair. I hope he does soon because I haven't eaten in days. Good thing I'm not really burning that many calories anymore. I like Best Fiends. Nay, I love it. And I know you will too. Download Best Fiends free on the App Store or Google Play. That is Best Fiends, not Friends. Fiends, which is friends without the R. Fiends. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. Chapter 3 Gregory Snyder My legs were wobbly and my body punch drunk as I walked to the front door and rehearsed what I would say. My uncertain eyes and incorrect words could give me away. I had to fake this right. Hmm. Maybe I should turn around. No. You remember why you're here. To save your daughter. I'd 
rip the heads off everyone inside and feed them to a stray dog if needed. I wasn't going to my own grave or visiting Terra's, knowing that I could have done more. Call it what you will, dear therapist, this right here is tough love, not that let her suffer bullshit. At some point, Tara had made this very same walk for the first time. She had courage, that was clear, but of the dangerous sort. Even if Brett had been by her side. Doorknob or knock? I wondered, but didn't have to do either since someone was leaving as I approached. No invitation needed. I took tiny steps through the doorway as if the ground was ice and might crack below me. A man stood just inside, ripped with muscles, each move smooth, and his eyes were on me in an instant. What you want? He asked. Now's the part where you say what it is that you want. He lifted his shirt to show a gun in his waist, hand teasing the handle, another hand on the doorknob. My clothes were full of dirt, soil from the garden, as if I had just crawled out of the earth. I was glad for it. A clean man would not have survived there. I'm just looking to get high. You say what you want. Um... Cocaine. Just, uh, just cocaine. Asking for heroin seemed a bad idea to me. Ooh, don't sell powder. You look like a rock man, you say. As I shot into my chest, my testicles rose up into my gut. I had thoughts of turning around, but instead I answered. Actually, I'm looking for a girl named Tara, too. I used to get high with her all the time. Um, have you seen her? Was this against protocol to ask? What was the code in these parts? I felt spirits moving about the house, bodies in motion, music pumping from the walls. I waited for my punishment. Tara, man, yeah, I know her. Black hair and tits, right? Yeah, cause without them, I think she was a dude. No, I ain't saying shit about her. You want a piece of ass, you say then you move on. Well, you want rocks? You buy them and go. You smoking here, I'm putting you in the basement. What do you say? Tara was there. Or had been there. I dug a $20 bill out of my pocket with no real idea what I was buying. The money in my palm was replaced by a tiny piece of tin foil with a chunk inside that reminded me of Roxol. I glanced around the room. The disdain for me was clear. So, I walked down to the basement, as I'd been instructed. Smoke rose in the stairwell as I descended. At the bottom of the stairs, I ducked under a beam and entered a cavern. Cement walls, cement floor, and a handful of sad pitiful creatures with backs against the wall, smoking, shooting up, and all I could think of was Tara being there. Over the years, places like this basement had coated her outsides and stained her soul, and I needed to find her, to save her. Somebody there had seen my girl. I held the rock in my hand, trying to prove I belonged, but not sure what was next. A man paced back and forth before me. Nervous ticks made his face twitch. He wore a green shirt with 88 written in white across the front. Hey man, you need a stem? He asked. What? A stem, man. A pipe. Smoke. I got one for the rock if you let me hit it. Maybe hit it twice. Come on, man. Thanks, I said, too grateful, perhaps, for the tone inside the place, and held up the piece of rock saw. Trembling fingers of the skeletal figure fired up a flame over the crack rock, and he sucked on the glass. His body started to quake. 
three puffs, each time noises like orgasms from his chest. Then, he presented it to me to smoke from next. I hesitated, felt eyes upon me. My lips felt infected just looking at it. If I didn't take a hit, then every addict there would point in my direction, scream that I was a fraud, that I needed to be killed or taken hostage, anything but helped. I had no choice but to be one of them. I fired up the lighter and sucked in the glass stem softly, no intention to get high, but hard enough to not be called out as a fake. I could hear the flame crackle inside the pipe. Cold smoke shot down my throat and froze my lungs. An electric current zapped my spine and a chill shot through my body. I blew the smoke out in an open mouth kiss. It rose to the ceiling, mixing in with the nightmares of souls gone by. Sounds of train whistles screeched in my ears so loud that my skull shattered like glass. Tiny pieces fell to the floor. My eyes rolled straight back in my head, synapses zapping electric. Oh, God, I mumbled. Either out loud or in my head, I couldn't tell. My bowels ready to let loose the swoon too much. What had I done? Don't. Take another hit. Don't. This is what it's like. And there was more to be done. A gangly-looking woman across from me started smacking her arms. She had chickenpox skin, and her jaundiced flesh glowed a rusty brown. Her father had forgotten about her long ago, that was certain. I didn't look away until I saw the needle pop her vein and her eyes slowly closed shut. Against another wall, I saw the furnace and an old washer and dryer, but I wondered how often Tara's drug dealer did laundry. The man in the 88 jersey was chewing on his tongue. I used to get high with a girl named Tara, I said to the man. Have you seen her? She's got black hair, short, spiky. Yo, man, I do, I do, and I have, and I know some things, but I wish I had some cash, man, you know? Yo, you look like you had some cash, and you know how nothing come for free. I seen Tara, but I ain't saying nothing more just yet. You've seen her? I'll give you some money, okay, but just, just tell me. When did you see her? His neck kept twitching, his face full of ticks. His pupils were like strobe lights in their sockets. His shoulder flinched up to his ear like he'd been tasered by police. His teeth chewed on his tongue, as if he were trying to gnaw it right off. I needed him to talk before he went one second more crazy, and my little girl was lost forever. I do, yeah, I do. I seen her, I know her. Brit's girl, right? Hot as fuck. Too. I almost fucked her once, but if you get in some of that, then I'm always one to help a brother out. I could tell you more if you give me what I need. My eyes traced the man's shirt round and round the 88s. Infinite lies. Infinite bullshit from his mouth. But I was paying for more. I pulled out a 20. And he accepted. Yeah, bro, Terrell was here, yeah, a couple of nights ago with Brad, but you wasn't doing too good, you feel me? Rage bubbled like lava through the cold, cracked smoke in my head. What happened? Tell me. I need to know. Tell me. Yeah, man, you want more? I know more, but I need a little more. You understand? Number 88 could sense I was desperate, and I was getting worked. He had art in his deal that I had none of, and I pulled out another ten bucks. I'd have given him a hundred if he could provide some truth. Aw, oh, hate to see you suffer. Don't fret, bro, but I'm not sure you'll ever see her again. Brett took her to the back room to get her high. Then a second or two later, all oh, hells breaks loose, man. Brett and Russell, they carried her out. She OD'd, brother. Not sure what the fuck they did with the body, but folks be dying all the time around here. Bodies get dragged out of here. Crazy thing is, I told her. I said, Brett is gonna kill you. And I told her he was gonna be 
poking her until she died. Shame, man. She's hot. Crack smoke and molten lava fought inside me. Keep it together. Keep it together. He's lying. Brett is in jail for one. Brett. Are you sure? Brett? Shaved head? Skinny? That's him, dude. Talks like he's smart. Don't know shit, really. Dude will fuck you over. You know that, right? He's out of jail. Yes, yeah, so. When he been here again last night, but not with her. My girl. Her body taken somewhere. Overdosed. My inside started to break, but why should I believe any of it? This man would say anything for his next rock and sat like a dog waiting for any more crumbs that might drop. I stood, found my footing, and dashed up the stairs, pounding each one on the way. I didn't say a word to anyone upstairs, but went right to the front door. It was locked and bolted. I clicked it open, and the noise made the owner rise to face me. His eyes didn't blink. His head ticked like a second hand on the clock. This was the Russell person who was said to have carried my girl in his arms. You think you can just leave? You think that? You come into my house and want to leave? That's what you say? I'm done. I'm good. I looked to the ground for a second. Too long, though. I cracked and gave him power. I didn't want to fight, but I would not lie on my back to submit for any dog. It cost you ten bucks. To leave? I pay you to leave? He laughed, white teeth glistening. The laughter got contagious and spread through the room like the wave at a football game. You pay ten bucks to leave without my boots stomping on your grill. Matter of fact, it's prime time. It's twenty now. My fist clenched and cocked. Volcanic rage rose inside me. Fantasies of taking a swing filled my brain. I realized that one person who would know what to do at that moment was Tara. She'd come and gone from Russell's many times, but I was being asked to pay a toll before leaving. Unbolt the door. I pay you ten, I said. He agreed with a grin, and I paid the toll. Out onto the porch, out into the night, I took two frantic steps rushing to my car, but instead I came face to face with the darkest kind of ghoul. His head was shaven, his skin pale, his body skinny, and his eyes shocked to meet mine. It was then that I did swing. The smack of fist on flesh echoed in the dark, and the surprised man fell from the porch. It was Brett. He had just walked up, was indeed out of jail, and was mine. With all the fury of a hell I could summon, I pummeled his face. As he squirmed on the ground, I stood over him, punching him across the bridge of his nose until he fell limp. I carried his body to the side of my car, praying he wasn't dead. Not at least until after I got him to talk. Chapter 4 Gregory Snyder Tell me where she is. Rhett finally woke up, and I breathed a sigh of relief. Tell me where she is, I demanded again. Why? Why do you go and do such things? I'm just here not hurting you. It's nonsense. His fingers examined his face for damage. Blood streamed from both nostrils and probably down his throat. His voice gurgled, and his nose was certainly broken. I know you've been with her. I don't know why you're not in jail, but that is something I can let go if you just tell me where she is. 
What did you do with her? I'm out of Wayne County Jail with full consent and knowledge of the court. I have a job and the judge wants me in society paying his wages with my tax dollars just like you. And I am also out of Tara's life because unlike you, I decided to leave her alone and let her live her own life. She's staying clean, man. You won, okay? You won. He was a frail, bony thing, and I towered over him. He sat like a boxer, beaten in the corner between rounds. Still, I wanted to kick him in the jaw and smash in his face. Amazing how drawing some blood made me crave for more. I will buy you some heroin, I promised. You just tell me where she is. Where did you put her? Number 88 could be bought. Brat had to have his price too. I told you, I haven't been with her. You're talking nonsense. Why do you care anyways? Just because she's your spawn. I understand having a junkie for a daughter reflects poorly upon you, but why do you want her? It's not like she wants you to find her. You know that, right? You think she would beat someone's ass in order to find you? Do you think she even wants your existence? I kicked him right in the gut. Not hard enough to hurt much, but enough to knock the air out of him, and he doubled over. You talk a lot of crap, you know. But nobody cares about you, do they? There's nobody out here looking for you. Nobody would care if you died. And the day you're buried, the world will be better off. My esophagus burned as I spoke. My heart sizzled, and the word shot forth like a Roman candle on that dark Detroit city night. A crowd of three walked briskly off the sidewalk toward the door of the dope house, like silent trick-or-treaters. They paid us no mind. Oh, <laughs> and you think you're better? He asked, blood spraying from his lips. You're right here with me. <laughs> And you get up each day and work for your fix. Same as me. Same with us. We gotta work to get our fix. <laughs> Only difference is, ha, I, I know what makes me happy. <laughs> Every single time. And it doesn't matter who you screw over, does it? Forget about my checkbook. That's stealing her cousin's video games. He is 11 years old. And then her grandmother's Oxycontin? We were going to get her hip surgery until we found out she was taking ibuprofen and that's why she hurt so much. And then scrapping metal from that school as you did? You're nothing. Nothing but a bullshit talking snake. <laughs> Tip of the fucking iceberg, my good man. You have no idea. <laughs> no idea what Tara will do to get high. Your girl's a dope fiend's dream, and it wouldn't be the same to get high without her. And let me add that Tara is expecting me, expecting to have my kids, expecting me to be with her always. Oh, we'll be together when this shit blows over, man. We'll be together. Where is she? I know you were here two days ago and carried her out of here. You want me to get the police to talk to you? I told you I haven't seen her. If she does get high, it's because of you. You know that's right. She told me. She said you got her high on Oxy her very first time so she didn't have to miss a soccer tournament. And then she got the itch. She's been getting her freak on ever since. Well played, my good man. Well played. The Oxy story was a half-truth. And he knew how to hurt me with that. My insides hummed like my stomach was a beehive. And everything getting stung just the same. I had no idea what to do next. Phantom buzz of my phone. I checked my cell. But this was no phantom. 
a text from Heather. Call me. She's at the hospital. I'm going there now. She's okay. Mostly. Call me. Relief rushed through me. Brett noticed I was distracted, so got up. Slowly. Testing to see if I'd stop him. I dialed Heather, who picked up on the first ring. Gregory. Oh, thank God. She's a Beaumont. She had an overdose. A relapse. I'm going there now. But she's okay. She, she, she's alive. I mean, she'll live. How, how did she get there? She's alive and stable. They said someone just dumped her. They don't know who, but Camera did pick up a Jeep Wrangler. Like Brant's. But he's in jail, right? Oh my god. <laughs> what matters is you get here. We need you. Where are you? Pressure in my head shot back up. Brain cells snapped. Sirens went off. Each breath I took was like a hit off the crack stem. I had a vision of Tara's body being pushed from Brett's jeep onto the black cement of the hospital parking lot. Alone. Holes in her arms. Holes in my heart. Both of us so cold inside. I looked up at Brett. He was halfway up the driveway toward the front door. Are you there? Where are you? I heard Heather ask from the phone. Taking care of her, I hung up. I dashed to my car, lifted open the trunk, and reached in the darkness and grabbed a wooden handle. Not even sure what garden tool I had, but I needed to act. I dashed at Brett with a thunderous war cry. He turned, and the whites of his eyes glowed, and I jabbed the garden tool into his neck as if I was a Spartan warrior. His jaw dropped, and my jaw dropped just the same, just as surprised as he. I was like his reflection, transfixed by his face and stuck in that moment. The reflection shattered. He gagged, tried to speak, but I only heard gurgles. I twisted the blade and something severed, summoning forth torrents of blood. When he fell, the blade came free. And I stabbed him one more time, puncturing his abdomen. Then, stepped on top of the tool with all my weight. The kill shot. It was not the shovel. It was the spade. And I had ripped open his neck and dug a hole in his gut. Brett would get high no more. You've been listening to part one of Garden of Fiends, written by Mark Matthews. Be sure to stop in next week for part two. Trust me, it is not to be missed. Mark Matthews is a graduate of the University of Michigan and a licensed professional counselor who has worked in behavioral health for over 20 years. He is the author of On the Lips of Children, All Smoke Rises, and Milk Blood, as well as the editor of Lullabies for Suffering and Garden of Fiends. In June of 2021, he was nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award. His newest work, The Hobgoblin of Little Minds, was published in January 2021. Reach him at wickedrunpress at gmail.com. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. 
it makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness. I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill, unless otherwise noted. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Felipe Ojeda under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's logo was created by Craig Groshek, and this week's artwork provided by Omega Black, unless otherwise noted. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for hundreds of free audio horror stories, including more performances from yours truly, and consider supporting us by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, I'm Jason Hill, and you've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast. Good evening, and sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 